Thanks so much, everybody, for coming. Um, I think you all know me. I'm Amy Keating. I have not known Bob the longest of those in this audience, but I have known him for a long time. <laughs> um, so it's an honor to get to introduce Bob, who finally relented and accepted Mondano's <laughs> insistent <laughs> invitations to participate. See ya. <laughs> 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 to participate in the dis, uh, department tradition, so you can find many other conversations, recordings on our website and on YouTube. And I encourage you to look at those. Um, that's what I was doing the other night to, to see how people have tackled the pretty daunting challenge of introducing our most esteemed colleagues. Um, so of course, I feel that Bob needs no introduction, um, not here where every MIT biology graduate student learns about competitive versus non-competitive <laughs> inhibition <laughs> from Bob within their first few weeks in the program, um, and also not in the greater field of protein biochemistry where Bob has authored over 370 papers, served on seven editorial boards in the field. It's hard to get for me to get good numbers on this, but he's had at least 20 doctoral students have, who have gone on to start their own labs. Um, and this has led, if you try to do some sort of rough, rough academic tree estimates, to, to hundreds, you know, well over 250 sort of academic descendants who have gone on to train others and to train others. Um, and really, this is propagated throughout our field. So Bob's made an indelible mark on protein biochemistry in America and around the world. Um, this is clear when I'm traveling and people continually inquire after Bob, um, send their regards, sometimes add an anecdote. Ask if he's dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> so just as an example of this, John Curian um, spending most of his introduction at his recent <laughs> seminar here at MIT, uh, talking about Bob and uh, specific <laughs> papers by Bob. And the zone of repulsion. <laughs> yeah, and people not sitting near Bob. Um, <laughs> gives you some sense of the impact that he has had. Uh, so Bob was department head from 1999 to 2004. He hired me in 2001. This was before we had the MIT NIFL program to help junior faculty buy houses in the area. And I remember our negotiation going something like me, gee, it seems like it's going to be really expensive to live in the Boston area. Okay, Bob, you'll be fine. <laughs> But I'd, I'd actually met Bob before that because he ran the famous Sour Kim Protein Structure Function Supergroup, which I attended when I was a postdoc in Peter Kim's lab here at um, the Whitehead Institute. And when Peter left for Merck, um, I was actually out on a job interview at the time, uh, but it was Bob who encouraged me to apply to MIT Biology, which had an open position that year. Um, this was a very daunting prospect, particularly for someone whose last biology course was AP biology. Um, and so I, I absolutely never would have applied um, to that opening if it weren't for Bob and his encouragement. I have no idea what he and Peter uh, said behind closed doors to convince people that it would be okay to hire someone um, like me with no biology background, but I'm certainly very grateful for the opportunity. Um, and so it was about two years later, I found myself teaching with Bob for the first time. We taught the small seminar course 776, Topics in Protein Biochemistry. And despite my postdoc in protein biochemistry, that class is where I really learned about the subject. Um, so when we're recruiting here, I often tell MIT prospective graduate students that I wish I'd had the opportunity to go to graduate school here, because I think we do a pretty good job of teaching our students to really think like scientists. Um, but in a way, I did get that education, okay, because I just got it by teaching with Bob. Um, 
and uh, I got a sort of personal tutorial teaching that class with him for nine years and experiencing many eye-opening moments as he explained to me what he saw in a paper. Um, so I was looking at the course evaluations from 776 the other day, and I was struck by the kindness or perhaps the cluelessness of our students um, in my first years teaching that class um, who didn't realize, I think, that I was learning with them um, side by side from the person who I still think after 25 years now in the field is the most insightful and clear thinking biochemist. So now I teach a different class with Bob. Now I teach the first year um, uh, graduate biochemistry course, 751. Um, and I was shocked to learn we've been doing that now for 11 years. Um, Bob, Lindsay, Case, and I gave the final review session for this class just on Monday. Many of the students are here. They survived the exam. Um, and I'm still in denial that this is Bob's last year as an instructor in 751. Um, we just uh, figured out that uh, Bob's been teaching that class for 35 years, I think. Um, and I think he's probably single-handedly responsible for a significant <laughs> fraction of the protein scientists today who actually understand the MWC Alistair model <laughs> in all of its elegant simplicity and who actually think about it and use it <laughs> when they do their research. Okay, so um, both inside and outside the classroom, I think I was pretty much terrified of Bob for my first 10 or 15 years here at MIT. Maybe you still have a little bit. <laughs> um, and that's not because he wasn't nice to me. Bob has always been super nice, very supportive. Um, but because Bob always seems to know the answer okay, to a wide range of things, um, he's also not shy about sharing his opinion of the answer, <laughs> sometimes <laughs> pretty forcefully. Um, and especially my early years here at MIT, Bob was one of the few people whose input I always sought when I had a question or a problem. Um, I heard his perspective about many things in academia, including student training, and grant review, and paper writing, and um, promotion strategies, and also just doing what you love in science. And I think about that advice a lot. I pass a lot of it on to others um, every day. So we all have role models. And over the years, as I've taken on new roles, I often find myself thinking of Bob and aiming to emulate him. Okay, even as he's led his field, writing the 370 papers I referred to where I assure you he probably edited every word okay, of those papers. Um, he's been a great citizen of MIT biology, of the institute, and in our field more broadly. And Bob doesn't seek self-aggrandizing positions, but he's the guy who steps up okay, when there's important work that needs to be done thoughtfully. So Bob served as president of the Protein Society, and I thought about that a lot when I was trying to decide whether to step into that role 20 years after he left it. Um, NIH study section service is a huge lift. Bob recently finished a six-year term doing that. He's chaired many NIH review panels. MIT biology faculty are not especially known for their high level of institute committee service at MIT. Okay, but Bob has served on those committees again and again, um, including as chair of the important committee on graduate programs. Um, he's given his time to be on the visiting committees of top biochemistry departments across the country. And he's helped HHMI review their investigators and the National Academy of Sciences select their new members. Bob's chaired our graduate committee here in the department on multiple occasions and, of course, served as department head. So I just want to emphasize we simply cannot run the department or the university or sustain our research enterprise okay, without thoughtful leaders dedicating their time, calling the shots, and Bob has done that again and again and again, and I really admire that. Okay, so enough for me. Okay. 
Um, one reason Bob is so terrific in the classroom is that he has a huge number of great stories okay, that we can all learn from, even as we laugh. Uh, so I'm going to get out of the way and let Bob tell you uh, whatever he wants to. <laughs> <laughs> Let's listen for his grades at Amherst College, ice hockey, and analogies to wood chippers. No wood chippers. All right. <laughs> Over to you. Well, that was suitably embarrassing. Thank you, Amy. Um, so Amy watched some of the old one of these to figure out what went on. I, of course, skipped them. Um, so I thought I'd tell you a few stories and maybe leave some time at the end. Uh, for questions, if there are any. Getting some feedback here. Uh, all right, so I guess I'm a big believer that you end up someplace largely because of how you were brought up. And I grew up in the Hudson River Valley in New York State on a mountain called Storm King Mountain. And how we got there if we could somehow turn down the mic in the back. Okay. How we got there was when my dad got out of the Army Air Force at the end of World War II, he was planning to be work for the insurance industry as an actuarial. He had been a math major in college, um, but he'd gotten married in the Army, and he needed a job while he studied for the actuary. Yeah. So in 1946, he took a job teaching prep school math at Storm King School, prep school on Storm King Mountain. He retired 40 years later from the same school, never having gotten around to taking the actuarial exam. <laughs> so I sort of considered it interesting that my dad had the same job for 40 years, and I've had the same job for 45 years. And in this day and age, that's pretty rare, right? I'm looking at a lot of my colleagues here who've been in, in this place longer than I have. But with the amount of time people move around, it, it's kind of surprising. As a young child, my parents were very worried about me because, to be honest, I didn't talk. When I was two, when I was two and a half, when I was three, my mom would go to the doctor and say, we think there's something wrong with little Bobby. And he'd say, he'll say something when he has something to say. <laughs> And sure enough, I was about three and a half, and a neighbor came over and was looking through our Sears and Roebuck catalog for something, and he couldn't find it. He was getting very frustrated. And I can't swear this is true, but my mother swears it's true. Apparently, little Bobby came up behind him and said, why don't you look in the index? <laughs> So apparently, I was just taciturn, and if I didn't think anyone needed to hear what I had to say, I kept it to myself. <laughs> um, at age six, I was in first grade at the local uh, Catholic elementary school, staffed by killer nuns. And I, was, I had like every childhood disease you could have that year. So I think I missed something like 200 days of first grade. And I couldn't read. And the nuns sensibly wanted me to repeat first grade. But neither of my parents wanted me to repeat first grade. So my mom decided she was going to teach me how to read. And the first week didn't make much progress. And then she had a brilliant idea. She'd start every session by putting a stack of 10 nickels on the table. And those nickels were in principle mine, except every time I made a mistake, a nickel disappeared. Within days, I was reading. <laughs> so bribery works. I don't remember a lot about elementary school other than the fact I was super shy. But I did stand for some principles. So in fourth or fifth grade, I forget what, Sister Amard 
was teaching some classic math problem. Johnny starts with 100 peaches, and he gives Sally this many, and he gives Joe that many, and some get rotten. And you have to figure out what fraction of something. And it's an invert and multiply problem. But Sister Amard got it wrong, so Johnny started with 100 peaches and ended up with 140 peaches. <laughs> and this just upset my sense of right and wrong. <laughs> So knowing this was the wrong thing to do, I raised my hand, was called upon, and said, think about it, Sister Amart. It doesn't make any sense that you can start with 100 peaches, give some away, and end up with 140. And I got to think about that all the way over to the priest's office <laughs> at, the, at the main dialysis. Um, my mom and dad were both math, math teachers. And I had five sisters. And Dessert was something that was used as a cudgel in our family. So if you didn't eat your disgusting Brussels sprouts, you couldn't have dessert. If there was an extra piece of dessert, my dad would make up math, age-appropriate math problems for all six of us to solve. And whoever solved it first got the dessert. <laughs> Two of my sisters went on to become math superstars. And after a while, I just decided I don't like dessert. <laughs> It, it, you know, there's a problem, there's a solution to every problem. <laughs> so growing up, I was always interested in science. I read a lot of books about science. Science fiction was my, my favorite genre. Um, I went to a working class high school where a few kids went to colleges you've heard of. Most went to SUNY Albany. About half didn't go to college at all. Uh, they went straight into jobs or went to community colleges. And you know, I ended up being valedictorian of my high school class. But the night before I was supposed to give the valedictory speech, there was a forest fire on Storm King Mountain. And since I'd grown up on the mountain, I knew all the trails up and down. And so I spent the entire night before graduation leading firefighters with Indian packs up the mountain to fight the fire. And I probably got home at 5 in the morning. And I think I had to give the talk at 10 in the morning or something. And fortunately, I had a very rough drop of the talk that my mom had spent the entire day rewriting for me, <laughs> getting it down from 430 pages to you know, some, some reasonable number. So I was tired. I still smelled like smoke. And I gave this talk. I was a terrible public speaker then. It really made me nervous. I still am. Nervous, that is. Um, and I thought, boy, the people are really wrapped. They're really into this. And it was an inspiring talk about how nuclear power was going to save the world, right? Get rid of hunger, you know, solve all our political problems, et cetera. It turned on, a microphone was turned off. <laughs> Nobody heard the talk except for the band. <laughs> so there's a lesson there somehow, I'm not sure. <laughs> exactly what it was. So in the fall of 1964, I applied for college. And I ended up applying early admission to Amherst College out in the middle of the state. And I'm not sure why exactly uh, I applied there. My dad did guidance counseling on the side at the prep school. He thought it was a good place. He took me around to visit various places. We visited Amherst on a nice fall day where, you know, it just looked beautiful. There was a nice view south to the Mount Holyoke mountain range. And something about it you know, just um, made sense. So I applied there. I ended up getting in. At the time, looking south to the Holyoke range, I didn't know that there was a strategic air command control center for all of our bombers. So this was like a prime Russian target, four and a half miles from my dorm. Now, had I known that, would it have made a difference? Probably not. Where I grew up in the Hudson River Valley, there was a major Air Force base 10 miles away. In fact, my dad, when he was in the Air Force Reserve, worked there on weekends as a meteorologist. Bobby, being the smart little kid that he was, thought, oh, he's a meteorologist. He goes into this big brick building at Stewart Air Force Base, and he decides, I'm going to turn the clouds on or make it rain. <laughs> Um, but you could always go somewhere in the country where you're safe, like my grandfather's farm in southwest Oklahoma. 
which turned out to be surrounded by Atlas missile bases. <laughs> so at least in the 50s, you know, there was no place that you could go that you were free of this. In school, we had weekly um, air drills in which you were supposed to, you know, basically get under your desk and put your hands over your head. And I realized I'd read enough about nuclear weapons to realize this was going to have no effect. <laughs> this wasn't going to help at all. But there it was. It, was. it was a different time. Now, actually, the real reason I went to Amherst was much more important. It had a pretty good soccer team, and that was my best high school sport. And it had a terrible ice hockey team. And I never played ice hockey, or at least on an organized level in high school, because my public high school didn't have a team. But I got to practice with my dad's prep school team, so I, I, I could play a little bit. But I figured, gee, maybe I'll be good enough to actually make the team in Amherst, and I did. And the lesson here is be careful what you wish for. <laughs> so the absolute nadir of my hockey career was a game against Colby College on their winter weekend. This would have been 1966, I guess. We lost 23 to 2. After every goal, the fans would chant, one, two, three, four, we want more. When it gets up to 23, it gets a little bit, you know, <laughs> overwhelming. In fact, they have, to, they have to wait to start, you know, the next puck drop till the fans finish their, their chants. So anyway, you're sitting in this locker room after the game, and you're thinking, can't get any worse than this, until you go out to the bus, which won't start. <laughs> so back into the hockey rink cold, dark hockey rink, sit there for three hours, waiting for the, right, the second bus to arrive from wherever they send it from, Montreal, perhaps. <laughs> now, the highlight of my hockey career came not playing organized hockey for Amherst. It came in grad school, when I was part of a sort of pickup team of law schools, mostly grad students, and several juvenile delinquents from Somerville. <laughs> and we would play a home and away series with Dalhousie Law School every year. And so one year I remember we, we drove up to Dalhousie, which is in Halifax, Nova Scotia, as most of you know. And have ever, if any of you have ever driven from Boston to Halifax, it's a long drive. So you basically left at six in the, at night and got in there at six or seven in the morning. So we got there and, you know, our host said, oh, we've got some places for you guys to sleep for a while. And then, you know, in the afternoon, before the game, we've got a special treat for you. We've invited the Supreme Court of the province of Nova Scotia to come and talk to you about all your great legal strategies. We had one lawyer on the team, I think. <laughs> and so we're thinking, oh my god, how can we pass this lawyer around to talk to the justices, all right? It turned out there was no need. Our juvenile delinquents from Somerville all had criminal records <laughs> and were more than happy to talk about how habeas corpus difference in Massachusetts law versus Nova Scotia law. That wasn't the end of it, though. About halfway through the reception, somebody taps on the shoulder and says, Channel 4 is outside for an interview. We're thinking, Channel 4? <laughs> this is a pickup hockey game, right? Uh, but no, apparently, the game was being televised by Channel 4. There's apparently not much to do in Halifax on a winter Saturday night other than to watch a couple of pickup hockey teams play each other. <laughs> so the other co captain and I go outside thinking, gee, I don't know what we think. We've never been interviewed by TV. And the, the guy from Channel 4 says, we've all seen Love Story and know that Harvard plays a pretty rough brand of hockey. And the other guy, Captain and I, are looking at it, Love Story? We've never seen Love Story, right? <laughs> no. And so we mumbled something about, you know, oh, yeah, we're looking forward to a game or something. So the game's televised. We turn out tying at 4-4. Four to four. We shouldn't have. They were a better team. We got lucky. But then we got to drive 10 hours back <laughs> to Boston, at least satisfied that, you know, I had a joke to tell when I finally gave my swan speech some <laughs> many years later. Uh, back to my college years at Amherst, many of you will know that I flunked out. 
And why did I flunk out? Well, it was easy. I got six Fs in two semesters. I don't understand how I passed the other two courses because I wasn't actually going to class. Um, but I had gone to Amherst wanting to be a physics major, and it became clear right away I was a big fish in a little, or little fish in a big pond, as opposed to high school where it was the reverse. And I was young, I was 17 at the time. I was really out of my element. And the real blow came when I realized that my math chops weren't good enough to be a physics major. So I'd be in some course, and the physics prof would ask some question. I'd be thinking, what in God's name did he just ask? And the guy next to me, who ended up being a physics prof at Brandeis, would say, well, the trivial answer is this, but the more interesting question is that. And then they'd have a conversation <laughs> for 10 minutes. So it became clear I wasn't going to cut it in physics. I, didn't, I tried a bunch of other things, and nothing seemed to work right. And the real problem was this is the time of the Vietnamese War. And at least at Amherst, that consumed all of the time and energy we had. We spoke nothing you know, during lunch, dinner, et cetera. We talked about nothing other than what was your strategy when you got drafted. Were you going to go? Were you going to go to Canada? Were you going to go to jail? What was going on? And it just seemed to me, I don't know what it seemed to me, but again, I stopped going to classes and flunked out. Now, it's not the smartest thing in the world to flunk out in the middle of a major war. Because <laughs> I had a deferment as a college student, right? But Fortunately, the county I grew up in in New York was mostly working class kids who couldn't wait to volunteer to go to Vietnam. Right? Had I grown up in Westchester County, 30 miles south on the other side of the river, everybody would have been trying to beat the draft. Okay? But my county, they had no problem meeting their quotas. So when I applied for a deferment as a conscientious objector, they asked me a bunch of trivial questions about you know, why do you think this, and blah, 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 and I sort of answered them as well as I could. Next thing I knew, I'd, I'd gotten the deferment. So then the question is, there's two things you can do as a CO. You can become an Army corpsman, okay, which means you go to Vietnam without a gun, right, to take care of the people who've been injured. And that seemed to me like, well, you're really helping the war effort doing that as well. The other thing you could do is get what was called alternative service. And one of the ways you could get alternative service was to be a technician in the hospital. And I knew that because a friend <laughs> had gone that route. So in 1968, I moved to Cambridge. It was the first time I moved here. And I started looking for a job as a technician. Now, think about this. I've just flunked out of college. <laughs> I've got terrible grades. Uh, why would anybody hire me? And the fact is, most people didn't. You know? <laughs> They'd say, well, we might hire you to clean the animal cages, except you're unqualified for that. Um, <laughs> and one day, I walked into Mass General Hospital. And I was getting discouraged, but they said, oh, there's a new young chief of the Endocrine Unit who's just moved up from NIH, a guy named John Potts. And I went up and interviewed with him, and he hired me on the spot. And I have no idea why, except I think he liked the idea I was anti-war. I think he liked the fact that I went to Amherst College because a couple of the MDs who worked for him were Amherst grads. In any case, maybe nobody else had applied. But I got hired. I showed up the next day. They said, make a buffer. I said, what's a buffer? <laughs> and we went from there, OK? Um, so the lab worked on polypeptide hormones that control calcium uh, metabolism, uh, specifically calcitonin and parathyroid hormone. And so it was basically a protein chemistry lab. We purified proteins. We broke them up into pieces. We sequenced them. Uh, we couldn't do mutagenesis in those days, but you'd chop them up into pieces and see if any of the pieces had activities. So I got really good training in protein chemistry in, in this job. Okay. And initially, I ran an amino acid analyzer, which is a fancy word for an ion exchange column right? that separates the 20 amino acids. And then you react them with an anhydrin, which turns any amino group purple. right? You figure out how much there is. 
Of course, the valves leak, you get an hydrogen all over your hands, and if you've got a hot date and you've got purple arms and hands, that's not the greatest thing. So someone taught me a trick. You just take DMSO. <laughs> now, they didn't tell me that the DMSO just takes the anhydrin straight into your bloodstream. <laughs> but you learn as you go. <laughs> Another thing I learned was my desk was like here, the amino acid on it was here, and a 50 cup lab coffee machine was here. <laughs> I figured, it's free coffee. What could go wrong? It turns out if you drink 15 to 20 cups of coffee a day, while you're reading H.P. Lovecraft science fiction, <laughs> you start to have seriously bad nightmares. <laughs> so again, no DMSO, cut back on the coffee. Uh, all worked out fine. So the good thing about working as a technician, it turned out I was good at what I did. The people I worked for gave me a lot of freedom to work independently. Uh, and I slowly rebuilt some confidence that, you know, I wasn't a complete failure, just a partial failure. So that was all good. Um, I published a bunch of papers that you probably haven't read because they're, they've got exciting topics like the amino acid sequence of salmon calcitonin. And, but one of the interesting things is when you learn to write, you have to try to make things interesting to people. Try writing about the amino acid sequence of salmon calcitonin. <laughs> oh, there's two alanines next to each other. Isn't that cool? <laughs> here's some basic residues. Here's some acidic residues. It never occurred to me at the time that these things have three-dimensional structures, right? that they bind to the receptors as specific things. But again, I was just learning. I was learning the craft. Um, so I ended up going back to Amherst, did a little bit better than I did the first time. And then when I graduated, oh, the highlight of my, of my time going back to Amherst was getting arrested with the college president. So a friend and I were coming out of the computer lab after having, you know, spent all night working on some highly sophisticated problem on our IBM mainframe, like fitting four points to a linear line. <laughs> right, this computer costs more than, but we don't even say how much it costs. The air conditioning to keep the computer from melting down costs more than we've ever spent on this stuff. But anyway, we're coming out of, of the computer lab at 6 in the morning, and there's all these people going on to buses. We said, what's going on? Oh, there's a big sit-in at the local Air Force base you know, against the war. Oh, that sounds cool. We hop onto the bus. You know? We get driven to Westover Air Force bus Base. You know, we sit down in the roll road. The police come and say, leave. We say, no. You know, and the next thing we know, we're all in jail, along with the president of the college. How cool is that? <laughs> all right? So that was kind of fun. Now, we did realize while we were in jail that both my friend and I had some not particularly legal drugs in our pocket. And <laughs> so perhaps that wasn't the wisest choice we had ever made of whether you get on the bus or not. So after graduating, I returned to, to Mass General for a year, uh, published some more papers, applied to grad school. And after my first two graduate applications, the first of which was to MIT and the second of which was to Harvard, I sort of got bored writing essays. So I figured, eh, we'll see what happens. MIT looked at my transcript and immediately turned me down, <laughs> right, sensibly. Harvard must have lost the transcript or didn't have anybody who could figure out how to interpret someone who'd had three different grading systems while they were at Amherst, 0 to 100, 0 to 13, and 0 to 4. And so, you know, again, it was just a hodgepodge. Harvard must have figured he's a smart kid. Uh, otherwise, he wouldn't have applied to Harvard. And they took me. Now, this wasn't a great time for science. Nixon had just canceled all training grants. Uh, funding for science in general was not great. 
1973. And so my entering class at Harvard, which would normally have been 15 or 20 people, was four of us, two of whom had their own fellowships, NSF, I assume, and two of whom of, of us got Harvard fellowships. And MIT, similarly at the same time, would have had a very small number of, of graduate students. So I had gone to Harvard. Well, it was the only place I got in, so I would have gone there anyway. But I, I went there to work for a protein chemist called Klaus Weber. And Klaus you know, did classic protein chemistry, but on biologically interesting molecules, repressors, and things like that. And I met Klaus at the, you know, at the, at the Sherry party in September for entering grad students. He said, Bob, great to see you. I'm going off on sabbatical to Europe. I'll be back in January. We can talk then. Klaus never returned. <laughs> so again, you know, the best laid plans don't always work out. Now, Harvard was an interesting place. Um, the faculty taught what they wanted to teach. So my freshman year there, first year of grad school, there were five courses on eukaryotic uh, gene expression, about which at the time nothing was known. Right? But these five people all figured, well, I'll teach a course and learn something about it. Were there courses in biochemistry? No. Genetics? No. None of that kind of stuff. The other interesting thing about Harvard is the faculty seemed to consider their major competitors in the world to be the other faculty members, <laughs> which just led to a kind of strange uh, existence. Um, I ended up in Mark Potashny's lab, which was a great place to be if you were super independent and didn't need any help. And about half of us in the lab were like that, right? Um, the other half needed a little bit of encouragement from the boss, and they didn't get it. So the good thing about this, I guess, was at the same time I was doing my graduate work, I was sort of a surrogate advisor to half the people in the lab who were right, struggling and trying to figure out what they, they were supposed to do. Now, at one point, I got somehow roped into agreeing to be on the, the graduate student council of, for the whole Harvard grad school. And then somehow I got elected head of that council, probably because I was the only guy dumb enough not to step back when they asked us to do it. And I realized, so I figured, all right, let's figure out what you do in the grad student council. And it turned out the grad school student council only had one job. And that job was graduate students all over the university would apply to the graduate dean for funding for whatever projects they wanted. You know, money for, for coffee and donuts, uh, travel money, this, that, and the other thing. And each year, there were about maybe $100,000 worth of requests. And the dean decided, we've got $1,000 to spend. So he'd, he'd, he'd take all the requests, give it to the grad student council, and say, you guys figure out who gets the money. And then he'd write to the, everybody who asked for money and say, oh, your fellow grad students turned down your request. <laughs> so I realized. This, 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 this isn't right. Even I knew this wasn't right. So I studied Robert's rules of order for about three weeks, which is about as boring as time you could ever spend. And we figured out a way to actually dismantle the Graduate Student Council in a way that the dean couldn't rebuild it for five years. <laughs> so that was probably my major administrative success uh, <laughs> in, in my career. Um, I told you the early 70s wasn't a great time for science. Most grad students didn't think they'd ever get an academic job. Any of the grad students I knew in structural biology, crystallography, et cetera, left before they got their PhDs. Now, fortunately, they went into the computer industry and became rich. Um, <laughs> but most people just figured, you know, they're paying me to go to grad school. I'll figure out what to do later. The idea of getting an academic job just wasn't there for most of us. And in that regard, I was super lucky. Um, my lab had a joint monthly group meeting with David Botstein's lab here in the biology department at MIT. 
And so over the course of a couple, three years, David got to know me, knew I was approaching chemist. And they were, MIT at the time had been looking for a protein chemist for the faculty for a long time. And everybody they interviewed talked two analinothiazolones just fine, but no biology, right? And so, you know, David said, why don't you apply for this job? And I said, David, I'm still a grad student. He said, I'll take care of that. <laughs> so the first thing David did was to convince his MIT colleagues that my time as a technician counted as a postdoc. <laughs> this was such a piece of, right, collage that no one actually noticed that I didn't have a PhD yet. <laughs> so I was invited, you know, to give a talk. I came, I gave a talk, it was somewhere over in building six. Um, and the only thing I remember about the talk was the slide projector blowing a bulb about eight minutes into the talk and having to fill 20 minutes of dead air, <laughs> right, while someone went to find a bulb, something like that. I must have told good jokes because I got hired and, you know, the rest is history, as we say. So lots of people, not lots, a few people over the years have said, oh, you know, there's a mistake on your CV. It says you started at MIT on July 1st, 1978, but you didn't get your PhD until 11 months later. I said, yeah, that's right. <laughs> they said, how did that work? I said, you don't have enough time to think it up. <laughs> so when I got here, I was offered two different lab spaces. One was on the eighth floor of building 16 overlooking the chart of high enough so you can see over the chemistry building. You're looking across the esplanade out into the, out into the hill. It's a million dollar view. Now, there wasn't really anybody on the eighth floor, but still. The other space was more space. It's where the VRW, right, stockroom is currently located in the basement of building 56, which was at the time the graduate student pit. That's why they call it the pit, okay? And I figured I could free the graduate students from the pit to this beautiful view, or I could take the beautiful view. <laughs> I went with the beautiful view. <laughs> so in 1978, this part of Cambridge was really different. Basically, everything here north of Main Street had been ripped down by eminent domain because NASA was going to build a computer center and somehow politics got in the way and they built it somewhere else. But that left space when the biotech right, revolution came through uh, for things like the Whitehead and the Broad, et cetera, so it's actually great. At the time, there was one place to eat in Kendall Square. That would be, these guys know, the F&T Diner. Right? We all had many a meal at the F&T Diner. Um, the current biology building was a TRW fac uh, factory at the time. But one of my favorite parts of campus was sort of on the corner where the STATA is and or part of the Koch Cancer Center, which was the East Parking Garage. Now, those of you who remember the East Parking Garage, it was a big sort of Soviet-style, uh, you know, six-story cement parking garage with a gentle ramp up and a really steep ramp down. And the good thing about the steep ramp down was if you drove an old VW Rabbit, as I did for many years, with a battery that actually often wouldn't charge, you would just park on the sixth floor, aim down, you'd open the door and you'd get the car rolling, and you could get up, of course, no power steering, but you know, you could get up enough speed going on the ramp to pop into gear, pop the clutch, and get the thing going. So for, for months at a time, I would do this. Why? Because a new battery cost, I don't know, 30 bucks, you know? <laughs> Maybe it was the challenge. Um, OK, so one more story. Um, there used to be a faculty lunchroom on the fifth floor of of Building 56, right across from headquarters. And some of the old timers, Salvador Loria, Boris Magasanic, Gene Brand, would be there every day. 
And as a young faculty member, you could go and listen to the stories and listen to the same story again. And you know, <laughs> after a while, it sort of became a little slow. But at the beginning, it was great. And at the time I was hired, I had a really bushy beard and hair halfway down my back. All right? That's who I was. And one spring day, I decided, the hell with it. I'll get a haircut. You know, I'll shave the beard. So I come wandering into the faculty lunchroom. And I'm getting all of these looks like, who's this you know, person sitting here? You know, are they lost? But everyone was too polite to say anything. And then about five minutes later, I said something. And Gene Brown Turk looked around and said, is that Bob? <laughs> So one of the big things that's different now than then is computers. When I was hired here in 78, the, the uh, department had just bought a Wang word processor, which was across the hall again from, from, from headquarters. And you could actually do word processing. Right? It had a hard drive that was about this big that crashed off and it had to be backed up every night. But you could actually do word processing. And before that, I, for example, ended up typing my own thesis at Harvard because I hired a wonderful young lady who was, you know, typed 140 words a minute, but she had this deletion phenotype that if she saw lambda oppressor here and here on a page, she would delete everything in between. <laughs> so, you know, the first day she turned out like 50 or 60 perfect pages except for major deletions of text. <laughs> so I sat down and hunted and pecked my way through, through my thesis. But word processes, changed everything. Um, I bought my first laptop, an Apple IIe, you know, a little bit later. It had 4K of read-only memory, <laughs> or RAM, actually, probably. Um, and at the time, we were trying to align protein sequences. And there was an algorithm called the Needleman-Wunsch algorithm where you sort of write, you make a matrix, n by n matrix, and the matrix is huge. Trying to get a matrix like that into 4K of RAM, you're writing on and off floppy disks all the time. Right? So things we now take for granted then, we sort of had to, had to do at the time. One of the really frustrating things back then was trying to figure out what a protein structure actually looked at, like by looking at these black and white stereo diagrams in, you know, and the idea that you could actually look at things on computers was only starting to come around. Greg Petsko, I think, had bought an Evans and Sutherland, you know, graphic system for $100,000 that allowed you to do that, but you had to sort of beg time in his lab to, to look at things. So what we all take for granted now with Pi Mall back then was, was just not uh, possible. So when I joined the department, all the grad students had to take 703 and 705, the undergraduate genetics and biochemistry courses, and they hated it for obvious reasons. And whether the obvious reasons were they'd already taken such courses, or they didn't want to compete with the MIT <laughs> undergraduate <laughs> pre-meds, I don't know. But I was asked at one point to start to put together a graduate uh, biochemistry uh, course Initially, we did something called 777 that Tom Rush Mandari and John King and I did that later morphed into a course called 731, the precursor of 751 that Frank Solomon and I talked for a number of years. And then, as Amy said, uh, well, Tanya joined us as part of that, later uh, Amy and, and now Lindsay Case. So we've been doing that for, for quite a while. And that's one of the things I'm sort of proudest of, I think, was getting a course that I think teaches people what they need to know to at least start thinking about problems from a biochemical perspective. I'm going to tell one other story, then I'm going to stop for questions. So I took one sabbatical, and that was in 1987, I think. I went to UCSF for six months. And I worked in Sandy Johnson's lab. Sandy and I had been lab mates at Harvard. And this was pre-email, obviously no Zoom. Um, and so I called back once a week to the lab to see how things were going. And whenever I called back, no one seemed to be around. <laughs> and I started getting worried. <laughs> and after about three months, I decided eh, I better go back. So I flew back for a week. And the son of a guns had gotten more done in that three-month period than they ever had in any other part of the Sowers lab existence. 
And I thought, oh, hmm. <laughs> not only am I not needed, I'm a physical drag on <laughs> research. So I went back to California, kept calling back. There was never anybody in the lab. Finally returned at the end of six months. Again, they'd gotten a tremendous amount done. But they all were sort of following you know, dead ends, things that weren't going to lead anywhere. And I realized I had always been a vicious micromanager in the lab. You know, when you're up for tenure, you don't want to take a chance. <laughs> you know what every student is doing all of the time. Um, and I had just kept doing that. And this experience taught me, you don't need to micromanage. These kids are plenty smart. They're plenty motivated. All you got to do is keep a gentle hand on the reins, steer them in the right direction once in a while. And that was probably the biggest lesson I ended up learning. So I'll stop there. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And if you don't have any questions, we can go early. I did hold the Amherst College record for penalty minutes for many years, yes. <laughs> I wouldn't call it a goon, necessarily. <laughs> but there were times the coach said, Sauer number 14 is really killing us. And I knew what that meant. So uh, <laughs> pretty soon, 14 and I would be in the penalty box for five minutes. And... We all do what we can, you know, in, in science and life. Well, I sort of do biophysical chemistry now, but I don't have to solve equations, right? Uh, and you know, as long as someone else has solved the equations and written the software, I love thinking about the physical part of biology. I just wasn't good enough to do it at a fundamental level. There's certainly something that should never see the light of day. I can, I, 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 can, I can tell you that. I don't know what paper you're referring to. Science is constantly reinventing the wheel, right? Uh, in part because stuff was published so long ago, people just never read it. In part because the questions have now taken a different turn, a new light. You can think about answering things at a level that we couldn't even vaguely uh, address back then. So, you know, the fact is, some of the papers you publish are great, some of the papers you published are terrible, and the problem is when you publish them, you don't know which are which. Yes? Thanks, Bob, for, for everything. But um, my question is, you met, so you, you alluded to you know, when you were first being, a, you were first a graduate student, like it wasn't a great time for science. No, not a great time. And then, but then, you know, you went and had a career and like saw how a not a great time for science then developed. So I'm curious, um, what are your thoughts about science today and your projections for how it might be developing? In the, in the future? Yeah, so I think some famous physicist said the thing about the, future is it's uncertain. But the one thing that's been utterly clear in my career in science is things go in waves, right? So in the 70s, people doing crystallography left the field because there were no jobs. I think two people got jobs as crystallographers in 1978 or 79. 10 years later, structural biology was the hottest thing going. Why? Because cloning allowed you to make lots of proteins that you could then do the structures of and learn interesting things. So 
I think the main thing is that things will always change. There are going to be good times. There are going to be bad times. And you know, if I have any sort of lesson for people, it's you know, if you do get lucky, take advantage of that luck, right? Because it doesn't happen all the time, and to some people it never happens. So you know, it's I've always appreciated uh, the things I've been able to do. Um, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing the stories. Um, I made most of them up, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. In Hearing your perspective about the, the period where you were a research technician yep. and then how formative was that experience and then trying to think about you know when you are discussing with undergrads and, and, and different students these days whether that is something that they should think about and and what, how that experience helped you then become say the grad student one of the fifty percent in, in Mark Fashion Slab yeah, I think it, was, it wasn't very complicated. I'd never really spent any time in the lab as an undergraduate, except in like formal lab things, doing the Millikan oil drop experiment where we never got a drop, you know, that kind of thing. So I'd never worked in a lab. I'd never, you know, figured things out. I'd never pipetted. I'd never done any of those kind of things. And so just learning that you can do that, that you can figure out how to do an experiment. If something goes wrong, you can think about ways to test it. For me, that just opened up a whole new world. It wasn't very sophisticated science at the time, um, but it just gave me confidence that there were a basic set of skills, a basic set of techniques that I could apply to an interesting scientific problem. And that just gave me the, you know, the confidence to, to build on that dur during my career. Um, but you know, I think most undergraduates now spend serious time in the lab doing real research. But if you haven't, I would for sure say spending some time working as a technician is, is a great way to decide whether you're really interested in, in this, you know, as a, as a job or not. And that role as a grad student in, in Mark's lab where all of a sudden you were advising, say, the other 50% of the lab, how did that come about? Is that just something that naturally happened? Yeah, I think I was always a I was always a busybody, and I always liked gossip. And you know, <laughs> hey, there is what it is, right? That's what it is. And so, you know, when people are struggling, you try to help them. And it turned out that just giving advice about how having to, having to do the science wasn't enough. Most of those people, who would have been great scientists, I think, had they, you know, been in given some encouragement by somebody you know, up higher, uh, could have done great stuff, but that just wasn't the way the lab worked. So now, you know, certainly most of us in Mark's lab who ended up going off and having successful scientific careers, our major thing was we're never going to run our lab like Mark ran his lab, right? Um, but you know, it's, it's hard to argue with his success in terms of, if you look at the, at the quality of the people he ended up trained, it's, it's pretty impressive, right? So again, lots of ways to do science. Yep. What was your transition like going straight from grad school into a professorship? And is there any skill that you wish you had had going in that you didn't have Oh, boy. So the scariest thing you will ever do, probably, is to go from working full time in a laboratory, right? having nothing really else to do with your time, to walking into a completely empty research lab <laughs> with no people, nothing on the shelves, and having to you know, turn it into a lab. You've never done it before. You don't know how to do it. Uh, so it's just scary, right? Now, the good thing about MIT was everybody was supportive. And you know, I got some funds from the department to set up a protein chemistry facility. And I managed to, you know, take a few of those funds and actually buy things I needed to do real research. Um, and so it turned out, but it's it just scary, right? Um, and again, you don't really know how to, you know, I mean, I was pretty young when I started. And, you know, my grad students were probably only a couple years young. Some of them were only a couple years younger than I was. And figuring out that you can't necessarily, you got to be the boss and not just, you know, a friend is, was a hard lesson. But again, there's a million different ways to run a lab. And you know, if you're lucky, you figure it out. Um, if you're not lucky, you don't. So. What was a scientific discovery during your career that you had that was completely taken by surprise? 
I think the biggest one was probably the discovery of the SSRI tagging system. A grad student in the lab sort of, we didn't discover it, but we discovered what it did and how it played a role in degradation. Uh, that's the global we. He, he did it. Um, I took full credit for it, of course. Um, and that was probably the most important thing we've ever done biologically, right? And then that, you know, that is what got Tanya and I, or that got me interested in directed protein degradation. And Tanya's lab down the hall was working on, on some of those problems already. And we started the collaboration back in 77, I guess it was which, again, has been going on for not 77. <laughs> uh, 97, 97, yeah. Oh, those powers of 20. Uh, yeah, and we, you know, we could have at the time decided to compete with each other and build a wall between our labs on the fifth floor, but instead we decided to collaborate, and that's been fun, and it's gotten into us, gotten both of us into places we never expected to go, so. Yeah, we agreed to work together on recognition. The SSRI tag is at the C terminus of proteins and it's degraded by ClipXP. And we had been one of the co discoverers of ClipX for its uh, unfolding of this um, protein involved in the combination. And we'd just shown that it also recognized the C terminus there. So we're like, okay, here's two C termini, one protein. We ought to be able to figure out the rules. How far have we, much progress have we made in that area? Um, we're we there. said, we said uh, <laughs> we're going to work together for like two years on that. And then, I don't know, it's getting to be a long time. <laughs> Go ahead, Joey. All right, it's always been remarkable to me. Like, from the time I was in the lab, and 10 years before that, and still continuing now, like, the FlipX has been this thing. Did you ever, when you started working, excuse me, when you started working on it, think that it would lead to I don't know what it's been, six or eight independent labs that also pursued similar things. And no, it, you know, what I always did in science is pick a problem I thought was interesting. And, you know, the first thing we worked on was how transcription factors recognize specific sequences of DNA. And after a while, that sort of lost interest to me. But at the time, we had studied that by making mutants, and lots of the mutants affected folding. We got interested in how proteins fold into precise three-dimensional shapes. And then also, at the time, we know some mutant proteins got degraded, others didn't. And so, as one area in the lab shut down, there was always something related to move into. Um, but no, I think when you start something, you have no idea. It would be this rich. That would be that rich, yeah. Right. I think like all the grad students, I only or I started off knowing you as a very amazing biochemistry professor. I was wondering if you had a favorite part, favorite section to teach of that course, or your favorite part about teaching that course to all of us. <laughs> you don't have favorite kids. You don't have favorite <laughs> lectures. You don't have favorite lectures in 751. <laughs> <laughs> I take the fifth. <laughs> One more. I, I have one comment, which is uh, you gave a beautiful introduction, Amy, about um, how Bob is a, um, you know, protein biochemistry like leader. Um, um, which I certainly agree with. <clears throat> but I remember the day he came down to my office and said, like, so what does ATB hydrolysis do again? <laughs> like, it always worked on protein folding. And, uh, you know, it, like, we're starting to talk about mechanism. And so um, he, uh, it was amazing to see Bob teach himself. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, again and again and again, um, different um, depths of different, I mean, he didn't know anything really that much about <laughs> enzymes. Um, <laughs> I didn't mean anything. He didn't know that much about enzymes. Um, so uh, that was um, very impressive. And the
I think the, ma the, the major thing I found was that most of what I probably know now I learned teaching. You know, uh, so it just, you, you, you deal with things at a different level when you're thinking, oh my God, they could ask me all these questions tomorrow. <laughs> and, and I, I have no idea what the answer is, so. Thank you all. <laughs>